Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you're listening. Welcome to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Bob Cook and me, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the first session. It's the a big first session. Yeah, it's a biggie. It's a big. It's a biggie for a lot of people. It's a biggie for most people who uh, are so apprehensive, and rightly so, because they are bringing their vulnerable selves uh, to the therapy encounter. Yeah, and usually they don't know what to expect, and though they want, they need to come for various reasons. They feel so apprehensive. So it's a very big step um, when people come to therapy, especially the first session, the first therapeutic hour, which actually for most therapists is 15 minutes and not an hour. I know. That took me away. Uh, it takes some of my clients a while to get around when I talk about an hour and they're like, well, it's not actually an hour, is it? I said, ah, it's like a baker's dozen. It's a therapeutic hour. <laughs> that's right. So... Um, yeah, so let's get on talking about the first session. So here we go. Uh, how I see the first th session is um, contact, contact, contact. In other words, the first thing I think about when somebody comes in through the door is contact, 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 and how we can really meet each other. Yeah, the contactful way. Now that is not so easy. And why is the premise for me in the first session is because without contact, then uh, that 50 minutes may well go uh, quite slowly. Yes. Yeah. So what's so do you see it that way? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the longer I you know, see clients. It's interesting when you say that that hour goes more slowly. I can kind of gauge where the client is on week to week by how the session goes. If if their defences are up, if there's something, they want to say it, but they're not quite ready to say it yet, those sessions go a lot slower than when there is a true connection when there's trust when there's yeah all that stuff going on it's interesting that 50 minutes can feel so different from session to session yeah well see when somebody first come comes you've got to remember two things it's the first session for the client and actually it's the first session for the therapist with that client yeah they might they might be very experienced now i'm very experienced i don't work clinically anymore but it would have been the first session for me with that client. Yes. Now, even though I've done a lot of clinical work, I still have a sense of curiosity, excitement and apprehension, as well as a lot more other feelings. And clients, as I say, will have many feelings, but usually the feeling which is most prominent would be apprehension. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, again... I, I filter things through my own eyes. So one of the first things that I often do with a client when they come in is ask them if they want tea or coffee and put the kettle on. That's the first thing usually. Do you take sugar and milk and those? Let them know that there's a toilet if they need one. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Can I ask you a question? You can. So for you, does the beginning of the first session start when you open the door and make the tea and coffee and everything else that you're just talking about? Or do you see the beginning of the first session um, for when those narcissists have actually happened? Um, bef before, that's, that's part of so it. Part of it. So you see that as part of it. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was interested in. Because psychoanalysts, I know we both of you and I come from the humanistic psychotherapy world if you like have a psychoanalyst 
which come from a long tradition of uh, the opposite of what you've just said. And they were, in other words, making tea and many of the things you've just talked about there would be heresy to a psychoanalyst. So that is uh, what would happen in their first session is the client would turn up and knock on the door or buzz the buzzer, whatever it is. The analyst would uh, let them in, into the room, sit down and say, let's talk. Now, a perfect example of that was uh, Joey Essex. Ever heard of him? Yeah. That uh, celebrity um, person. Yeah. Seemed, I really quite like, by the way, for lots of reasons. But he, I don't know if you watched it. I did. He, yeah, he talked about the same things when he when he was talking about the death of his mother and his life. And I thought that was extraordinarily brave of him to do that and to do it on television. But he went to see a psychoanalyst, right? And he knocked on the door and the psychoanalyst came in. And the next thing you saw was him sitting down and then the analyst sat next to him and they started. Yeah. So I think the psychotherapists from psychotherapy worlds are often... And I, I do the same as you, by the way, often brought up in a tradition which is different from the psychoanalytical tradition, which often would say, would you like a cup of tea and like a toilet and how are you? Or have, have those sort of sort of gentle pastiming processes to help the person perhaps feel a little bit more at home uh, before they start, which is why I asked you the question. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's, it's I think it's quite important that the room is, set out in you know a, a, a neutral way that it's it's kind of like a neutral ground there's not too much of me in that room because I don't know what could trigger another person I don't know what certain things mean to certain people so I try to keep my room as general as possible I've had clients that even a ticking clock is enough to take them to a certain place in their past. Yes, but if we and if we're talking about the first session, right, which is, I think you're talking for the first session onwards, there is another way of thinking about that. So how we move away from the first session, perhaps we're not, but let me just tell you this story. So uh, when I uh, first opened the Institute up, we ha used to have, and you know this, Friday night seminars. Yes. Uh, for two hours, uh, we used to get somebody in to talk about various psychotherapeutic topics. Now, I always remember um, I invited two drama therapists in to talk about two hours to talk about psychodrama. Yep. Sounds good. Well, that, well yeah, it was at one level. Um, they arrived 20 minutes early and said, or oh, more than that, half an hour later, luckily I was there, and said, we need to strip the room. So I wanted, now my training room is quite a big training room. With a lot of coaches. <laughs> lots, of coaches lots of pictures. I said, what do you mean strip the room? Take all the pictures off the walls so that exactly from your perspective, so the people have uh, nothing to project their fantasies into and we have... Uh, a neutral room as much as possible, which I said was almost impossible in my room. They said, well, we, we would like to do that. So I said, go ahead. In their therapy rooms, they would have nothing at all except for a couple of chairs and exactly uh, like you perhaps, minimalization so that people aren't able to project their fantasies onto it and get triggered like you've just said, right? Now, that was very interesting. I enjoyed the, the, the discussions about that with them. And we now 40 years late, no, 25 years later, and I'm uh, much more clinical experience and understand where they're coming from. And you're right. And, you know, quite often, if you want people to get into their unconscious quicker, it's useful to maybe have many of these things on the wall that you're talking about because yeah. they'll actually get to their unconscious, maybe through triggers that you wouldn't even know about. And that's fine for me, as long as I then follow it up. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And sometimes it, it is enough for them to comment on it or to mention it or to do something that then is another, you know, opportunity to explore. But yeah, I, I, I think I'm more talking about 
I don't know, family pictures of myself and putting too much of me in that room. Oh, you're talking about you're talking about that high idea of too much of yourself. Yes. Which is another interesting one. And largely I agree with you. Now on the first session, somebody comes in, let's get back to the first session again. I did watch that Joey. I'm glad you watched Joey Essex things, which I wanted to mention mention this podcast because he went for his first session very scared, very apprehensive. He'd picked, interesting enough, he'd picked a psychoanalyst, I think, from probably either a psychoanalytical directory or it'd been directed this way. I suspect it'd been directed, actually. But in the first session, um, he, he, it's really interesting because if you talk about contact, 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 uh, you'd be interested, well, I was interested in how they actually contacted each other. And I thought the psychoanalyst did that in a very gentle way by actually um, what I would call inquiry, uh, very different from how I see many other psychoanalysts, by the way, uh, uh, gentle inquiry questions. He didn't overwhelm Joey Essex too much in the first session. Uh And that is one of the things I wanted to say is that one of the things not to do in the first session is to uh, overwhelm them so they become either more scared or you never see them again yeah yeah 100 percent. because i think you know they're gonna have their own story about how it's gonna pan out They'll, they will have i would imagine fantasized and come up with lots of different scenarios on how it's going to be what's going to happen in that room all those sort of things and i think if i remember rightly joey essex kind of the first statement that he came out with was how nervous yes he'd felt and that he hadn't slept well the night before so he kind of said go easy on me <laughs> and he and the analyst did yeah yeah See, i thought that was a really really good program i think for someone like joe it's a role model for so many people to allow himself to be that vulnerable in therapy and talk about such deep issues was fantastic yeah, and yeah. the fact that he continued on in therapy yeah after the program he was still got yeah yeah mm-hmm. so i was very pleased so it's really important not to overwhelm we need to somehow get contact with the person in front of us and the second maxim i think is um how we help people to tell their story about why they're there Interesting. Hmm. Say a so bit more about that. How we get into contact and how we enable them to talk about their story, what brought them in the first place, are probably my two starting points. I don't know what your two starting points are. I'm, I'm curious about what, what do you mean, how you enable them? I, I, yeah, I... I kind of say a little bit once, once, you know, they've, they've got the drink of coffee and we're sitting and everything. Then I, the first question I usually ask them is how are you feeling? Just so that they have that opportunity to say, you know, either I'm absolutely petrified or I'm fine or what, whatever it is. And, and something about this room is a safe space. There's no judgment, you know, there's no nothing that you can't talk about in this room to kind of give them permission i i don't know what people think they can and can't talk about in a therapy room and that maybe they think there are certain rules the only rules i do say in the first session is that you know you can't come under the influence of alcohol or drugs um that's one thing and that there's a, a you know a no violence there's you know yeah. so, it's, so it's, you do some several many really excellent things so two of my uh mentors if you like um uh, eric Byrne and richard erskine eric Byrne talks about the importance for structure hunger and richard erskine talks about the, the relational need of safety and security needed by everybody. So what you talk, what you're doing, I think, 
is setting the safe, the scene and the structure so the person can feel safe enough to be in a relationship with you. Good, because that's that's kind of what I think. You know that yeah, is it if they've never been before, then they kind of don't know. Well, like going back, it's the first session that we've had together. They might have been somewhere else, and it might have been done completely different. But for me, I think it's important that I just set the scene if that makes sense and, and there's that, something about holding them in that safe space as well that's really really good i mean um to set the structure to um tell them a bit about what therapy is or it isn't and what the ground rules are uh which will only enable them to feel safe with you um i was a bit struck about the question about how they're feeling um but uh perhaps you can say a little bit more about that so what you're saying is that you, one of your sort of uh, important considerations in a first session is to check up what they're feeling. More if, if they are feeling overwhelmed or stressed or anxious in that moment sat in front of me. How would you know that? Well, that is a valid question. That That is something that I would probably go on to say. You know, if they say, oh, I'm absolutely fine, I will probably say something like, how would I know if you were anxious? What would I be seeing or how would I, you know, yeah. Yeah. See, for, for many people coming in the room, you will know uh, probably, you could make an assumption about uh, uh, their level of distress or not. So they'll be agitated, for example. Uh, they might be uh, sweating, for example. They, they might even say, like Joey Essex did, I feel very nervous um, and many things. So I can imagine you saying that or a therapist saying that or what you're feeling at the moment to get a, what I would call a contact transaction. Now, um, I think that, that that's what I meant by contact. Um, I, don't put, I don't probably set the scene as much as you do. Um, I, I, it's an interesting one that um, people have different styles, but I am interested in uh, how they make contact and perhaps even more how they don't make contact. Because how they don't make contact properly is as important as how they do make contact. Yeah. Because that will mean that's one of the ways they aren't able to make contact uh, in life and relationships outside the therapeutic sessions. So in the first sense, it doesn't mean I will, you know, necessarily share what's in my head, by the way, but, you know, or, or I may choose to do that. But I am interested in how they may stop themselves being in a relationship with me as well as how they are in a relationship with me. Yeah. So many of my inquiries are aimed at, i say, making contact, helping them tell their story, and what I believe people most come to therapy for. And that is to, to find somebody who will help them uh, understand themselves. And to be able to talk about what often is Ununderstandable. That's a word. It's a Bob Cook word. Ununderstandable. In other words, love it. They don't understand it themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that word. I'm writing that one down. Understandable. It's not a Scrabble word, but it's because it's way past seven words. <laughs> Ununderstandable. Yeah. So the, the the other thing that I was I was starting to write down though when you were talking about the un understandable business would you say that you kind of normalize their experience could you give me an example I, I think I know what you mean but I'd like to know what you know what you mean but well it's kind of like sometimes clients come and you know, they'll say, I don't think you've ever seen anybody that's as bad as me. Uh, There's nothing that can, I've tried everything and nothing works. And it's, 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 yeah, I, I wanted, the word that was coming to me then was there's a challenge there put out from the get go. Yeah, because it's on the same lines, which I think you're so good at, by the way, uh, which is actually creating safety and security for them to be in relationship with you. So, of course, by normalising someone, or however you do it, by the way, by saying, you know, it's pretty natural in these sorts of circumstances for you to perhaps have 
a level of feelings or feeling or feel X, you know, to, or whatever you said to normalize the experience. Someone is also in the realm of helping them feel safe to open up with you. So, yes, I may normalize. It's not top of my list, by the way. Um, I see it as something I do. I should probably do that sort of automatically. So yeah. if somebody said something like that, I probably automatically would normalize in the experience. So but my roadmap for first session is much more around if I was thinking about this and the viewers, sorry, the listeners, it would be contact, 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 helping somebody tell their story, helping them uh, uh, at least helping them understand that it's okay for them to tell the story and perhaps help them talk about what is ununderstandable and then go from there and the going from there probably is and I'm not sure if I do in the first session but I, I, I would if it was an assessment session so perhaps you know is there much difference I would help them perhaps look very gently or tentatively about how the past affects the present and how that might be partly why they're not getting what they want in the world today now if i get to that in the first session um which i usually do by the way um but it's towards the end yeah you see i think most people come to see you have thought about how come i'm like this how come i'm over angry how come i can't stay in relationships how come i feel so nervous how come i'm extraordinarily anxious how come i overthink how come i xxx i think most people start thinking about that right and it, it, if i can help them and i think they thought this by the way help them understand that you don't suddenly become like that overnight you don't have a baby that's overthinking you don't have a baby that's over aggressive you don't have a baby xxx they become that way that's part of their personality and if you can help them understand that the past affects the present and the cure is in the past actually even though you feel it's in the present yeah you're halfway there yeah. whether you get to that in the first session i usually do get there uh but i don't know in how much of a big way but it's a quite a pivotal a pivotal uh thing for them to start thinking about yeah it is and yeah i i'm just thinking i i was at my sister and my mum's earlier on and my mum's of a certain generation you know <laughs> we have some really good conversations about psychotherapy where you know if it's in the past just leave it there why do you need to keep going back why do you keep need to harping on about it and you know that's kind of how she sees life it's happened it's not happening now get over it mm, mm. and that's 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 that generation and yeah also for many people because deny you know the automatic psychological survival mechanisms of denial uh often kick, kicks in so keep everything in the past and why talk about it and let's compartmentalize it just like joey essex said uh, to that analyst in the first session uh but then he also said i need to talk about this because i'm not moving on i'm stuck yeah yeah so even though he was terrified of going he knew that yeah and it is it is terrifying you know, and it can be overwhelming to people and it's scary looking back, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not sure who it was who said it, but if it was hard, you know, going through it, why would you want to go back there again? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So the first session is ultimately, sorry, is very, very important for two people, therapist and client, meeting each other the first time to attempt to get the you know a human discourse going enough so between the two people in that co-creative creative relationship um can actually you know um summarize or at least get to a place where where, where the client um can see that coming back may help them yeah wonderful yeah it's it, it, it and, 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 I, and I, I don't know if we've got much time, but perhaps next time we can talk about 
we have started to talk about the art of that. But you see, people are trained for many, 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 many years how to help that happen. In other words, when I say contact, 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 what does the therapist do to enable contact, contact, contact? And what does the therapist do when the person resists contact, 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 which they're bound to do mostly? Yeah. Now, Jerry or Essex actually nearly didn't go back. Yeah, yeah. So he would have, bro he would have broken contact in a big way. Yeah. But the, th the analyst was very good because he um, allowed him to do it at his own pace. Which is another thing I think is really important is the therapist in the first session works out the pace between the two of them needed so the person can feel safe to be able to talk in their own rhythm and their own pace. Because if that doesn't happen, again, contacts will break down. Yeah. It's it's funny, you know, unless you, you've kind of had the opportunity to sit in a room with just one other person where, you know, it's not just chatting, it's a completely different universe behind yeah. that closed door, which is kind of like what we Absolutely. wanted to open the door on in these podcasts. Yeah. You're right. And what you neither of us talked about, which is quite remarkable as we come to the end, is confidentiality. Yeah. Now, you did, in a way, because you were talking about how safety, security, uh, so you sort of did spell it out. But I do want to say that from the listeners, that from the beginning, we talk about confidentiality and what that all means, because people, if they don't feel secure, um, probably won't open up in the first place. So it's a sort of hallmark of our career. And the next podcast, I'm assuming, might be what I would call uh, what we well, we start in the first session, but take six, seven, eight sessions, maybe, or at least the next four or five. And that's the creating of what is talked about when they talk about the working relationship. Because unless the therapist and the client can have a working relationship of trust, safety, security, confidentiality, they won't come back. Yeah. So that's really, I think the next podcast really is we start that in the first session and then we continue to build on that, which will become a template for this therapeutic encounter to foster. Is there anything that you say towards the end of the first session to the client as, I, I don't know, just what might happen the following week when they're not in the therapy room between session one and two, if that makes sense. Yeah, I usually say something like, look forward to seeing you next week when we've worked out the diet and everything else, and we'll continue where we've left off. And until then, have a good week. Okay. It's usually something like I say that. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, you know, I'm not saying I'll always do that. Maybe I'll summarise what we've where we've got to, and then say something like that. But one thing I think you're leading, or well, perhaps you're not leading to, is that if it's 50 minutes hours, I always think about having that summarisation or those transactions probably after you know closing down the subjects area after 45 minutes, so that we can actually summarise say what I've just said before the clock hits 50 minutes and we have to go home. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, maybe it's the parented person in me. I don't know. I have been said before now that I am quite parenty, but it's more kind of a, you know, just a bit of self-care stuff between now and the next session. You know, it's... Yeah, it's, I say, that. I say well done. And, and, you know, it's really important you've got here. And sometimes this will stir things up and trigger things. So make sure that you yeah, go that and watch the, have a hot bath or watch the television. And don't do anything dramatic tonight. And just be aware that we can percolate this. And I'll see you next week. Yeah, Something yeah. Like that. It, it's that kind of, you know, it's not like you walk out the door and that's it. There, there, are, there is an a internal process going on from here going forward now so just be mindful that you might have 
you know, have certain memories pop up, that's absolutely fine. We can talk about that next week. Yeah, that's a really good way to end, I think. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, I, I learnt from a master. I'm still learning everything you're saying. Yeah. I'm writing so many notes down, Bob. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good. I like the way you, you, you have an emphasis on the first session on safety, security, relational needs, and the way you end. It, it shows a high emphasis on containment, safety, and security, so that the working relationship between the two of you will foster, which is what I think the next podcast should be about. Sounds like a good follow-up relationship in the therapeutic encounter, something like that. Yeah. So I think that's what, because that's what the first session is really, really setting the template for. Yeah. Brilliant. So we yeah. will go on to episode five next time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Look Thank forward you, to Bob. It. Take care. Thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.